So with us today, we have Thomas Gilligan, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Gilligan served as the Ted and Diane Taub Director of the Hoover Institution from fall 2015 to the fall 2020. Um, is a longtime scholar on antitrust, regulation, political economy issues generally, and also uh, on serving the board of Southwest Airlines and KB Homes, a home builder company, amongst other things. He was also our dean here at the Macomb School of Business uh, from, what was it, Tom, from 2007 to 2015? Eight. 2008 to 2008, 2015. Anyway, Tom, yeah. welcome to Policy McCombs. Yeah, glad to be back. Thanks a lot. Uh, so our conversation today is going to be around the idea of stakeholder capitalism versus um, versus versus shareholder capitalism. And, and, and I'm going to start here by going to something that was on the campaign trail during this fall, where yeah. President-elect Biden said, and I quote here, it's way past time for us to put an end to the era of shareholder capitalism. An idea that he described as an absolute farce. He went on to say that corporations have responsibilities to other stakeholders as well, such as their workers, communities, which they operate in their country. All right, so let's start by defining these terms a little bit. Yeah. So clearly we have our new president saying that it's time to end this. It's time to end this farce. Uh, so uh -huh. what is this farce? What is this, the shareholder farce? And what is this new idea of stakeholder capitalism? Well, so neither ideas are new, for one, so, but uh, they, they've both been around for a while. Shareholder capitalism, I guess, uh, properly defined is simply that the purpose of a company is to advance the interests of shareholders, chiefly returns on investment or profits, subject to the laws and customs of the so societies in which they operate. So it's basically you, tr you have the equity owners or a private company, just the owner of the company. The company should strive to, to advance the interests of those owners subject to uh, obeying the law, the customs, and the ethical mores of the times. Uh, stakeholder capitalism recognizes that almost any company, regardless of its size, is going to have implications for employees, for people who live in the communities in which the companies operate, uh, maybe for citizens around the world, say if the company emits a lot of uh, pollution, et cetera, and they're impacted by these corporate decisions. And therefore, the purpose of a corporation is to somehow take into account or balance the interests of stakeholders, sh the shareholders of which are only one of the potential stakeholders. So and the way to think about the first one is that the first one's a market mechanism where shareholders form a firm and they hire labor, they sell in markets to consumers, uh, they produce according to the laws of the jurisdiction which they operate. This, on the other hand, the stakeholder concept is more of a political concept, like a city council where you have a lot of people with varying interests and all of these interests should be weighed uh, in various ways in order to balance the interests of stakeholders. So um, one of it with a very clear utility function, something that we think about and when in a yeah. simple economics problem, maximizing that utility, and the other right. one, the utility functions more generally defined by multiple players, multiple actors um, in, in the system. I think that's right. So when you think about current law and current either federal or state, um, yeah. is there a particular, a particular statute that reinforces either one of those views? Yeah, I, th I think it's safe to say that the current system of law and regulations that exist both at the federal and state level in the United States uh, strongly embed shareholder perspective into corporate purpose. So for example, um, laws, even recent laws like Sarbanes-Oxley uh, promulgated by the SEC, the federal government enforced by the SEC are designed to make sure that shareholders have a transparent look and accurate information in order to assess the performance of management and directors about a company. So it's all designed to give information to shareholders. State laws, uh, I think also embed shareholder capitalism. Uh, in the state of Delaware, where most Fortune 500 companies are incorporated, particularly large companies, uh, really makes it ex an explicit obligation of directors and managers to run a company in the interest of the shareholders. Now, to be sure, it doesn't say don't take into account other stakeholders, but they view the other stakeholders as instrumental and in that their st other stakeholders need to be treated in a way that furthers the interest of the shareholders. So for example, you know, so for example, it, it does, it, you know, a company that was neglecting or treating its labor force so badly that no one was staying, everybody was quitting, it was very hard to retain, uh, recruit and retain the best uh, employees, uh, that for that company to be cleaned up would be totally in the interest of the shareholders and that would be, the law would expect you to do that. Uh, I think there are uh, other states too uh, that embed something like constituent 
uh, provisions in their state and corporation laws, which allows directors and, and managers to explicitly take into account the interests of stakeholders. But once again, it's in this instrumental fashion. You know, you're free to take into account the impacts on communities, employees, labor, uh, environment, to the extent that it can be shown to advance the interests of, of uh, the, the shareholders. So for example, you think about major corporations now who buy carbon offsets to try to impact, to lessen the impact of their uh, emissions on the environment. That's just a clearly a costly activity that cuts into the bottom line, but the courts will easily take the rationale that this is being done so that shareholders in the long run are not overburdened by unreasonable regulation or, or other kinds of punitive political activities that could take place if the companies were more indifferent to the environment. That's just one example. So, so that, that the court, courts would be okay with that, even though perhaps at this point, it might be something more like a signaling that companies might be doing for the, for the benefit of their customers to make sure that customers are happy with their activities, for example. Yeah, I think that's right. I think in, in the companies in which I serve, uh, the business judgment rule gives the management and the board quite a bit of discretion about the activities in which they engage so long as they can rationalize it as being in the interests of shareholders in some relevant time period. So uh, uh, just a side question on that when we talk about courts, do you see much of a, more room for litigation as a result of boards and executives taking positions that are maybe not as directly attached to the bottom line? Um, in other words, so if, if the business uh, a judgment rule was something that can be stretched now to incorporate other sources of, of, of information that may be construed as something that relates to, to, to shareholder value, um, does that open ourselves to more litigation, more, more, more essentially that way costs? Oh, it, it could. I don't know of any cases yet. And I think that there are other disciplinary mechanisms, non-legal, non-regulatory, that would come into play before the courts would, would be a vehicle by which aggrieved investors could challenge the actions of management. So the, the, like, like active, active uh, uh, board members, essentially, or... or hostile Active, things and yeah right. activists you know so for example if a company were engaged in, in activities for the right reasons let's say uh but were thought to uh erode the bottom line of the financial performance of the firm it, it it would be possible for an activist to do what an activist does which is try to acquire stock and and the interests of other investors to try to replace management or directors to reposition the firm in those other ways and those are the other other ways in which um uh, the shareholder capitalism perspective is embedded in our current customs that uh, markets like the remuneration of executives and boards of directors are extremely tied to the financial performance of the firm. I mean, uh, and, and there's been a litigation in recent years about say on pay and about the use of long-term incentives and vesting and clawbacks, which try to align the financial interests of the people who are making decisions about the daily operation of the company and the shareholders. That's, that's an even more powerful mechanism, in my view, than the law. Uh, it's also the case that uh, uh, the proxy process, by which almost every year for almost every firm, uh, all the directors and the management are re-elected by the shareholders, uh, that's a really strong and powerful mechanism uh, for ensuring that the companies are run in ways that advance shareholder interest. Uh, those, those are semi-political or voting systems, if you will. Uh, they're fairly accessible to uh, sh shareholders, um, but they haven't yet been used to advance what I would call public interest, you know, like uh, adopting more stringent environmental standards than the regulation requires. Um, they have, they have been used to advance uh, diversity issues on boards, the placement of women and minorities, on boards, et cetera, but you haven't seen this broad move yet uh, of using proxy mechanisms to embed social or political values in corporations. So, so in, in some ways, I mean, when you look at all the, I guess you describe the alignment between all those issues and the bottom line at the end, right? So yeah. the, the value yeah. to, to shareholders is somehow aligned to a lot of these issues and the market mechanisms in place right now, market and legal mechanism are very much defending that and, and it's, it's so far that sort of the view that Milton Friedman had that as long as business are doing um, uh, what is good for their bottom line they are benefiting all stakeholders in the process. Uh, yes. It seems to be the, the, the still the law of the land and the way companies tend to operate. Yeah I and I think that's right and I you know I'm a big fan of it. I think that you can trace back very directly to shareholder capitalism a lot of the wealth that's been created over our lifetime and a lot of the advancements 
uh, both in, in raw economic satisfaction and also medical discovery and innovation. And, and I think that human um, welfare uh, and, and enjoyment has just been greatly advanced by this particular form of corporate organization. You know, I, I also think that uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer or an invalid criticism to say that shareholder capitalism necessarily ignores or takes advantage of other stakeholders in the process. There are markets in which people operate, labor markets. If a company is not treating its labor right, it's not uh, training them properly, it's not, it's not paying attention to its human capital needs, you know it doesn't do very well. It doesn't retain people. It loses its best people. It's hard, it finds it hard to find anybody to take a company there. If you have companies uh, you know, that degrade the environment much, much more than their competitors, uh, consumers care about that. Activists in the political realm talk about it. Consumers move away from those things. I mean, you and I in our lifetime, we've seen this, right? Like uh, the use of child labor or just labor that doesn't use of labor in ways that doesn't conform to Western standards has been the basis by which uh, companies like Nike have have changed their modes of production and dealt with their suppliers and outsourced providers in ways to try to bring their standards up to the norms and the ethical customs in the West. And I think that's had a, a big impact and it's done that under shareholder capitalism. So I don't think that it's right to say shareholder capitalism necessarily ignores or necessarily takes advantage of other stakeholders in the process. I like to use the money ball analogy of the Oakland A's start hiring a bunch of slow guys. Yeah. Uh, it turns out there was an inefficiency there. And by discriminating yeah. against slow guys, teams were, teams were uh, spending more money than they should to get hits. Yeah. Right? So once yeah. the team figured that out, the market became more efficient. And, and, and it was not about the types of players about like me improving the bottom line, the bottom line improve the market for, for the labor, uh, for, for, for the supply of labor in various directions. Right. So that's, uh, yeah. I like to use yeah. that example in our classes as a, as a way to, to point out that um, if there is an inefficiency, the market will explore eventually. So if you're a little underpaying somebody that, that, that has high human capital, well, that person right. going to have a place to work and is going to deliver value yeah. to another firm and yeah. you better learn that. Um, yeah, so I think within the context of this, I think one of the things that's changed again in my lifetime is just the quantity and quality of information available about the operating practices of company around, companies around the world. So uh, if, I, if I am very much concerned about the way in which labor is treated to produce a product that I use extensively, it's easy, easy for me to figure that out. There's an assurance uh, prospect that I could that I could execute on by doing a little bit of research or relying upon activists around the world or relying upon just certain kinds of reporting mechanisms would tell me how labor is treated in these certain areas. If I care very much about, uh, say, uh, carbon emissions right around the world, because I care about climate, the climate or climate change, it's, it's fairly easy for me to track down uh, um, kind of industry comps about who's doing well and who's doing less well in these areas. And it's in easy for me to fold those into my consumption decisions by and large. Uh, so I think that's the way in which you're talking about the market becoming efficient in this context is that it's using this information that's ancillary to the purchase and consumption of a good to inform m my consumption decisions in ways that advance social objectives in this context. So to that end, um are there disclosure uh, type requirements and things that facilitates that? Are there government interventions that help in the direction in terms of regulatory things? Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or just still, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Before I answer that though, let me, let me kind of just say that, you know, when people criticize shareholder um, capitalism more vigorously, they, they tend ironically to um, kind of point the finger at failures in government regulation. So for example, you know, one, one, a lot of people say that the shareholder capitalism approach is not realistic because governments don't properly regulate the competitive environment of, of firms. They allow firms to get too large. They allow too much market power. And then the philosophical argument behind shareholder capitalism breaks down, right? Or they say governments don't properly internalize the externalities of companies. So companies are allowed to freely pollute in ways that harm people both locally and globally. And that again, can't be justified on a philosophical basis. Uh, it's also the case that, as we were talking earlier, that just companies engage in behaviors that are independently valued by everybody, consumers, by labor, et cetera, and the governments are not properly policing or writing laws and rules and regulations that take these things into account, right? So 
one thing, one way to kind of deal with this is through the assurance process you're talking about is, uh, is to, is to think of a, think of, let's call it this, let's call it stage one stakeholder capitalism. Let's call this a stage. I'm making this all up too. This is just has no weight other than in my imagination. It, it could be a form of capitalism where, uh, you, you just use standard assurance techniques to give people the information that will allow them to make independent judgments about the social correctness of a company. So, and this is, this is growing, to, to finally answer your question, this is growing dramatically. There, in the past uh, you know, 10 or 15 years, there's been this concept of environmental, social, and governance properties of firms that have become increasingly important in the way in which people evaluate the performance and prospects of firms. So for example, let's take the governance issue. Are, are your boards and management teams sufficiently diverse? Do they include enough women and, and uh, people of color uh, to take advantages of the purported benefits of, of diversity? Uh, uh, and on environmental, are you, are you operating the company in a sustainable fashion? And I think in the corporate world, this means uh, Will it be sustainable against in the long run with respect to uh, the conditioning of the air or the treatment of water, et cetera? Will it be sustainable when government finally wakes up and decides they need to regulate against this environmental harm? Will you be able to continue on after that point in time? Uh, and and uh, environment and social is just other, other kinds of activities. Are you engaged in behavior as a firm that uh, reaffirms your community, builds up the community, uh, helps it with its problems, helps it, um, you know, be a better resource for the company in the long run? So this is all what I would call assurance, and I think this this assurance view of stakeholder capitalism has been reinforced recently by this modern by the statement of the Business Roundtable, which basically, in a really full throated way, endorsed stakeholder capitalism but in an interesting way, in a way which kind of denied that there were trade-offs between social and private ideas in a way in which they indicated that you just absolutely have to take into account the interests of other stakeholders, but that's totally consistent with shareholder value maximization. You know, it's, it's kind of like I, our, our colleague, uh, Sheridan Tipman, would call this costless social responsibility. That's, if you read that statement pretty clearly, that's what they have in mind. This is, this is also the idea that is embedded in, the, in, in certain major investment advisory firms' guidance on what stocks they'll buy and hold, which ones they won't. If you read, for example, the BlackRock statement on the kind of way in which they evaluate companies, uh, they absolutely affirm uh, an interest in these ESG factors and in the broader social impacts of companies on society. But they also say, we're not going to make value judgments about politics or ethics. We're going to evaluate them within the context of, is the company taking these factors into account to promote shareholder interest? So that's, that's kind of very interesting. This is, I mean, this is, if you're, for, for your students or anybody out there who's really interested, the World Economic uh, Foundation, I believe, World Economic Forum, excuse me, uh, They've been working on this for years, and they finally came out with a with a really deep document in I think October or September of this year, which was on incorporating ESG factors in evaluation of company performance. Ironically, and this will this will tell you why I'm using the word assurance. This report was done in conjunction with the the big four accounting firms in the U.S. Right, and I I do have I'm, I'm an economist, so I have a lot of friends who just, who are just cynical. And their view on the whole document is that it's the big four accounting firms trying to start a new assurance business. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and my view is I, that's okay. I mean, that's fine. I, I think I'm an economist, so I think markets work better when there's more information as opposed to less. And I think assurance activities are totally fine and there's not, nothing really wrong with them. Uh, so, but I think the way, one way to understand s s the modern version of, of stakeholder capitalism, at least in the U.S., and in most of the West, is that it's an assurance mechanism designed to bring in these social concerns in the evaluation of corporate performance. All right, so so that that is is is, is still within the market mechanism to some degree, right? We're just allowing yeah. more information, more information to be available, and people to make better decisions as a function of that. Yeah, are there non-market mechanisms that that you that you see coming our way from again going back to the statement that the Joe Biden yeah. the campaign trail? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what are the, the types of, of, of pushes that we might be seeing coming from, let's say, the federal government in, yeah. in the future and trying to maybe codify some of these things into law and regulatory framework? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I don't think the president elect, you know, in that speech, he didn't propose anything. He was, it, it was more kind of, we need to look at this kind of an idea. And it was done in rough uh, uh, conformity with the timing of the new business round table afterwards a little bit but it was interesting but there are examples of countries let's imagine, Western, a, let's imagine elizabeth warren is the secretary of the trade yeah exactly so uh she had proposed in 2018 that uh a certain percentage of the board of directors be elected from uh, labor unions or labor groups that worked in a company so that's one specific political way to incorporate at least one set of stakeholders labor into the decision apparatus of a corporation. You could also think about electing members from the community. You know, so like I'm on a home builder board, you could look at all the areas that uh, in which we build homes and say, look, you know, 40% of your board needs to, needs to be populated by politicians or people who represent the interests of those communities. Uh, you can think of doing the same, you know, with respect to global part. I mean, you think about a, um, a petroleum company that's producing carbon that is being emitted and diffused broadly around the climate that affects everybody. So maybe you should say there should be two people on a on a board of an oil company who represent the environment, the interests of people who are environmentally harmed by what they do. So you can think about, uh, you can imagine uh, um, a regime in which this happens. Now it is the case that in you know in, in co-determination states in Europe like Germany. Uh, there are requirements to have labor on a certain number of labor members on the board, and uh, you know, the, and I've been recent reading recently to see if what the effects of this were. I mean, one one predicted effect is that you'll have underinvestment of these firms because you know current labor are not long term. They're not people who are long interested in the long term of a company, where shareholders are because they can always capitalize the long term effects of investments in their shares when they sell them. So there, there's a question of do they underinvest, and I haven't. I'm not convinced one way or another yet. There's a lot of research on that. But you can see that this is something that it seems to me the president-elect Biden will have to grapple with if he decides to create a more political way of, of enforcing stakeholder capitalism. And that is, how do you want to do it? Uh, what are the benefits of doing it? And what are the unintended consequences of doing it? Another way to do it is, you know, uh, remuneration for executives. So right now, remuneration of executives is tied uh, really heavily to the financial performance of firm. Uh, it doesn't preclude tying remuneration to social factors. Starbucks recently decided uh, tied the pay of their executive to diversity factors in their human capital. Uh, there's no reason why you can't do those things, but a President Biden might say, lists pass something like Sarbanes-Oxley, which asks the, SEC, asks the SEC to mandate certain ESG factors be included in CEO pay structures. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to do it. There are a lot of levers you can pull. Again, um, there would be a lot of arguments back and forth about what the intended and unintended consequences of these things would be, but it's, it would be a more fulsome and robust way to embed stakeholder capitalism if you think that's the way you need to go. So I have a couple of questions on the on the, the Starbucks example. What strikes me as problematic there is that you're asking executives to engage in potentially illegal behavior in order to achieve a certain a certain uh, outcome for yeah. themselves. Right. right? Like you're, you know, you're de facto asking them to impose a quota. Uh, I don't know if they specify some you know ratios uh, for yeah. for the outcomes or it's just like a, you'll define. Oh, we want more diversity without specific yeah. goals because you could get to the end of the court and say, well. I'm missing, you know, one Brazilian here. So I'm going to go hire for my barista Brazilian. Yeah. Right? And that's not necessarily uh, legal on the basis of, I guess, origin, country of origin is not a protected class, but there's other, <laughs> other, other uh, ones that, that they are protected. So I, I'm a little concerned with that in, in, in the, well, not concerned. It's just something that I, I wonder how that's going to play out when you put yeah. uh, executives in that particular uh, situation, right? But the other thing that you mentioned was the, the potential uh, issue of, of, of divesting. Um, so do you see this dynamic playing only in the public traded companies or, because one of the things might be, well, I'm going to go to the private markets. I don't right. want to share my decision-making power of my dollar as an investor with labor, yeah. with members of the community, with et cetera, et cetera, right? Sure. I want, I want to have supremacy in my, in my dollar uh, yeah. uh, decision power. 
Um, is there a fear that we might that might lead to more dollars being invested in private equity in private markets that you and I are not going to have much access to? Uh, that might lead to increased inequality, for example, uh, access to returns that many, many, many people there are not going to have the, the, the ability to get. If yeah. there's a trade-off, I suppose that that price yeah. is a trade-off, right? No, I think there is. So let me address both those. I think the uh, Starbucks case is interesting, and I think you raised an interesting question. I'm not a lawyer, um, but it, I, I, but I'm kind of. I think it's relevant to remind ourselves what's happened at major universities who've tried to impose quotas or other kinds of race-based admissions policies, right? Uh, and there, I think the, the standard, the hurdle is even higher because a lot of these are public institutions. So University of Texas is, always has a case going on. Harvard and, and uh, private universities have cases going on. And I think that one, uh, looking at corporations, which tend to be private, you know, they don't have a a public obligation the way UT Austin does. I, th I think there will be general, generally a lot of latitude about how companies want to try to impose their um, diversity requirements or in implement their diversity requirements in, in their company. I don't think they would ever use quotas, right? But they would use incentives or, um, um, you know, payouts or scholarships in ways you know, to bring people in. They have to worry too, when they do something like this, they have to worry about the effects of those policies on the rest of their labor force though too. I mean, if, if you're in a non-protected class and you get into a company that's really aggressive about promoting protected class people, um, you know, those people are at risk, all else equal. Uh, some of them are, some may want to be in that environment too. But but I guess I guess the only observation I would, make, would want to make is that I think private companies have more latitude in public universities about how they want to incorporate uh, a person's identity or status in employment decisions. I think uh, with respect to your question about, I think, let me, let me put your question bluntly. Suppose we have a very aggressive politically based stakeholder uh, capitalism move in this country. Will that reduce the size of public equity markets relative to private equity markets? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, I think I think we've seen this over the years as it's more costly. Public capital's got capital's got more costly relative to private for a lot of reasons. A lot of it's regulatory, Sarbanes Oxley and Dodd Frank and things like this. I think another round of additional assurance requirements or additional embedded or explicit cost would cause people to look even more to the private markets than they do now, which I think is a great loss because. Um, you know, private equity markets are the major way in which most people uh, get access to investing in this country. I think, I, correct me, uh, Carlos, because you probably know this better than I, I think something like 100 million people in America have equity investments. In some, most of them are done in mutual funds or in union pension funds or things like that. And it would be really a shame to see that market contract even more than it has, you know, over the past 10 or 20 years. So uh, that's just what I was saying, when, when you want to kind of push out these regulations to promote politically based stakeholder capitalism, I think you just really need to look at what the unintended consequences might be from these activities. And that would be one that would be very hurtful if it were to occur. I, I, it reminds me of a, of a, a tangential point, a paper I read recently about the impact of a corporate tax onto inequality. So yeah. a corporate tax dis discourage you from incorporating. Right. And by discourage you from incorporating, you let it tend to have more idiosyncratic activity, which means that you'll be uh, there'll be more big winners and big losers, which then right. create more inequality in the system. Right? And I think something similar to that happens if you're not in the public markets, you're going to concentrate things in the private sector, in the private markets, and you're going to just create a few very big winners. And yeah, and 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 which is not necessarily something that that I think the same folks that are more aligned with the idea of a stakeholder capitalism also would like to see a world in which there's less inequality. And those That's policies right. might be leading to, to more inequality as a, as a consequence, right? So yeah, yeah. Well, so this is for a policy audience, I assume. It's a, I'm a 66-year-old man who studied the economics of policy for as long as I can remember. And there are, all, there are always unintended consequences, and they almost always serve to frustrate the original goals <laughs> of the policy. I mean, that's just the iron law of policies. Right, right. Um, so let's let's stay to in, in this idea of, of investor as well when it comes to to stakeholders uh, the, the considerations. Uh, so when BlackRock goes out and says we're going to impose some sort of we're going to hope to impose some sort of uh, measure of ESG in our 
in the way we yeah. think about managing stocks and managing funds and so on. Um, and they, they do have a large uh, amount of power here represented by the way in which we, a lot of investing takes place these days, right? If I'm holding a, 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 an index fund, for example, I might have many pieces of many, many different companies that I don't know about. I'm not, yeah. I'm just following the sort of smart advice of holding something that's sure. buy and hold the market, right? And BlackRock is operating and deciding what goes into that bucket to some degree. Right. Um, there's very little oversight that one of these 100 million people that you just mentioned have over that. So again, do you have any worries about the, the potential? If they are just focused on a fiduciary duty or just increasing returns, and that's it, then, then we are aligned. But the moment yeah. they start making considerations that are ethical or uh, environmental or social, that might not be aligned with me. Correct. And yeah. well, one of the 100 million people here. Right. So right. how do we resolve that, that issue? Yeah. yeah. So let me say, let me, let me kind of read what's in BlackRock's investment statement. They, here's what they say. They say they believe that well-managed companies will deal effectively with the material environmental and social factors relevant to their businesses. But they go on to say, we do not see it as our role to make social, ethical, or political judgments on behalf of our clients, but rather to protect their long-term economic interests as shareholders. Okay, so I think, I think they're firmly in that camp where you say they have a fiduciary yeah. duty, they recognize it, they're only looking at these other factors has material for assessing the financial performance of the company. I think that's fine. I also think though that there are other advisory firms that are starting to form who do ESG investing to advance the values of their investors as well as the financial interests, right? So um, uh, there are some funds, ESG funds, for example, that uh, just won't have any carbon-based investments in them, right? That's one scrub. Or they will have, the, you'll have other funds. There's, there's, you know, there's literally, I think, hundreds of these funds now that always have a particular stand, not like, not like BlackRock, but a stand to invest in things that satisfy some important value or virtue that their investors care about. And there, there are people who study whether they do better or not, sometimes they do better, sometimes, like any financial investment, right? At the end of the day, throw a dart is the, is the deal. Uh, but I do think that, that those firms are out there. I think they're good myself. My view is that uh, an investor cares about their money, but they care about other things too. And I think it's fine to have a financial investment firm or advisory firm who says, we'll try to advance both parts of your personnel at the same time. Uh, you don't have to. You don't have to invest in it, right? You could short. You could short it if you want to go the other way with it. Uh, so I, I think it's another market solution to um, a need or an interest or a demand uh, out there for investors. And I think it's great that those firms exist out there. I do think the big the big firms though uh, will probably stay away from this, and they'll encourage their clients who want to be more intentional about their investments conform to certain values to move out of them. That'll be the interesting thing to see if when a BlackRock uh, says one day, well, can't invest in carbon companies anymore because no one will invest on us with us if we do. That may happen. But it, BlackRock will at least, I think, frame it in a way uh, which says that we're doing this not because we per se care about this, but we don't think there's a financial return appropriate to the risk attached with these investments. That's that. That's interesting. And at the same time, you have you have um, like pension managers, right? They have a yeah. fiduciary duty with with individuals. Yeah. They're not trading on their values at all. They're going correct. Be, and that's going to persist. And and but you might you might see the same type of judgment. Like, well, this might be too risky and not necessarily financially um, yeah. um, uh, interesting for, for for the clients. Now, the interesting part of that is that if for some reason it's not risky, you divest from let's say oil or related, yeah. related things. And those companies keep making a lot of money. Um, well, demand for their stocks is going down, so prices go down, but returns go up, right? <laughs> so right. As, a, as right. a result, and, and that'll be interesting to see the, the type of like forego returns that, right. that uh, folks might complain. And listen, you had an opportunity to get those returns and you chose not to, not because of my financial right. interest, but because right. something that you would deem as a, as a, as a not, not particularly profitable, but yeah. It's a, if it's a business judgment rule, right? You, you can always you can always get away with that. 
Yeah, and I think there probably will be a market for advisory firms who take advantage of overshoot on the value. The non-ESG, right? the non-ESG yeah. funds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, okay, so so let, let's move a little bit to to you know you, you were been a dean of the business school for a long time, both at USC and then at yeah. Texas. Um, do you see a change in a way we, in which we approach business education, take into account yeah. this this notion of stakeholder capitalism? If I open a textbook in finance, one of the first lines there that says that the goal of the corporation is to maximize shareholder value. Sure. That's like paragraph one of any corporate finance textbook. Sure. Um, how are business schools adapting to this? Yeah, so I can I just take a long run here? Sure. So just a long, say 30 year run in this. I, I, think it's, um, I think it's obvious to me that the social dimensions of a business, its impacts, have been a greater focus in business education over time, you know. So I think if you go to a lot of business schools today, you'll you can you can take a class which is uh, very dense in business ethics. You can take a class that's very dense in in the political activity of businesses, business lobbying, uh, how businesses interact in the formulation of regulation, uh, those those kinds of deals. I think the societal component of business strategy and behavior is much more important now than it was 20 years ago, for sure. Uh, I, th there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I, some good, some bad. Uh, the bad part is that governments tend to fail, in my view, fail more often than they used to. Uh, maybe because the world is more complex, maybe because we live in such a divisive society. We seem to fight about everything. We're politically divided down the middle. Um, but I, I think if you are a student in business school now, I think that you are going to be expected to know a lot about the way society and politics works. Uh, hopefully you'll learn the same amount of accounting and finance and marketing that you always learn. But uh, I think you're going to be asked to put it in, in, in to work in a broader context that requires you know something about the, the politics of business management. And I, it's, I think it's sad that that's true. I wish the world were simpler and it was clean cut and everything, but it's just not. It's just, I think that the power and the impact of business on people of all stripes is substantial. And uh, no matter how, uh, you know, clean or the rules are or the regulations are or how proper the business conduct is, there's always going to be a political um, price or tension or demand put on a company. And I think companies need to deal with that, need to be able to deal with that. And, um, but do you, do, uh, like more in a, in a, in a more uh, specific way, is there anything that we should or, or you've seen us teaching more in a way that that's organized that makes, makes better use of, the, of those ideas in, in a way that, that is deliverable to students? My fear, the reason, what I'm trying to say is this, I think that there's a lot of like lip service and a lot of this notion that, oh, profits have to have a purpose. And, and this notion that, that rainbows have no trade-offs with money. And, and somehow everybody yeah. wants to paint a picture that's actually more sure. um, devoid of like a hard content associated with what it is, what are the trade-offs you're facing, what are the economics, the political economy of it. I don't see yeah. a political economy to our students. I guess that, that's, that's, that's my question. Yeah, so, and, and um, maybe they should know a little bit more about the grand trade-offs that are made when one adopts public policy. Uh, and that's important. I think the trade-offs for our, our students that are important for them to know, though, are the ones on the ground in the companies that they have to deal with. So, uh, you know, every, every um, you know, just I'm thinking about cases, you know, the cases that we use in our classes are always about decisions. And oftentimes the decisions have a, have a part of them or a component or an impact on, on something that's outside the firm, you know, on the community, on labor generally, on the environment, and I think that understanding how to assess those within the context of a broader understanding of the way politics work is nece is necessary. Um, I, I guess I don't think that um, you know I know what you, I know what you're talking about. I mean, some people maybe if you read the business roundtable statement where there are no such thing as trade offs, it's everything is win win. They literally say that everything is win win. It's it's kind of hard to take seriously unless you put their political context in perspective. You know, they're 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 trying to advance the interest of companies who they rightly understand to be in a, in a politically tenuous situation. Mm -hmm. One where we could be on the precipice of much stronger restrictions and constraints on corporate governance than anybody in the corporate world really wants. 
And I think that's what they're, they're dealing with. I don't think they, I, you know, I know the person who wrote it, I don't think he actually believes there are no such thing as trade-offs and it's a win-win. I think you have to judge it within the political context in which that statement was made. Um, I, I think, you know, on the other hand, I think, I think we moved away from kind of this really, uh, you know, my, one of my favorite movies is Wall Street, right? And everybody likes Gordon Gecko. It has, has a caricature. I think it's hard to find that caricature anymore. I, th I think, for example, you might be able to find it in a couple activist investors, um, but I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a widely applicable or revered personality type or model for corporate behavior anymore. I think uh, the kind of executives I think are, are held in great stead are those that create long-term value and a, a lot of sustainability for their business. In other words, it's going to be able to stick around because it has integrated itself into society in a way that is deemed to be productive and worthwhile you know, beyond, for more than just the, the shareholders. And I, I think that's the more realistic view of where we are right now. So let me turn the conversation a little bit to, okay. to the sort of general attitudes towards big business in, in America. I think that the, for me to both right or left, I think there's a lot of skepticism. And even with all these attempts of trying to show that we're creating value, we're incorporating a lot of social ideas into, into our decision making, and it, it, we're not led by a bunch of Gordon Geckos out there. Right. And there's still a general perception that, that big business is a, is a force for bad. It's something that I think more so in the left than in the right. But an example huh. of it right now is, is big tech. I think there's a lot of suspicion yeah. and, and, and concerns about, about the role of big tech or the, the market power of big tech and so on. Let's not talk about big tech and media because that's definitely right. a charge element right now. But right. Um, let's focus on, on big tech insofar as, as they are too big. They are monopolistic. They might be hurting consumers. Uh, and at the same time, I think we're very you know, happy and, 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 and benefit tremendously from all the products that big tech has generated uh, sure. for us in the past few years. So we wrote recently something about, about Google and the antitrust case that Google has been charged uh, with and yeah. made a connection to Standard Oil. So let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, so yeah, Google, as everybody knows, it, uh, Google's in trouble with everybody all the time, right? And uh, as they should be for, for a lot of reasons. But w recently, the federal government, along with 11 states, filed an antitrust claim under Section 2 of the Sherman Act, uh, which basically says that Google has un unlawfully obtained the dominance that they currently enjoy in, in search markets and browser markets and in online advertising markets, as well as just um, the operating system for smartphones, et cetera. Uh, and, and the government in this case, they're just trying to make the argument that that's true. They didn't, in the case, spell out the remedies they would like, uh, such as breaking up the company or forcing it to divest in any serious way. Uh, but they just, we're in a period now where there's gonna be some arguments about whether or not there is a, they do have dominant positions and whether or not the dominance was obtained illegally. Uh, let me just make a few general comments and Carlos, you can ask me more questions about it. One, um, this is really uh, an American phenomena that is highly predictable and occurs with a lot of regularity. So if you go back uh, to the, you know, the, the original Standard Oil case, I mean, Standard Oil was a company that was formed in the 1870-ish time period. Uh, to take advantage of new drilling techniques and refining techniques to produce kerosene primarily. They ended up producing 300 other products out of a barrel of oil. Uh, they reduced the cost of, of, of refining a gallon of kerosene by 85%. Um, the, and, and they passed a lot of these benefits along to consumers, so much so that they achieved a 1.90% of the market. And so the government uh, comes in and says, that's too large. Uh, you're, you're, you're too big, this is not competitive. And by the way, you achieve this dominant position unlawfully, right? By merging too much or predatory pricing, charging below and driving your competitors out and buying their assets and bringing them in, et cetera. Uh, the, the Google case is very much like that. I mean, Google wasn't a company until 96, right? And, uh, and even then it wasn't much of a company. It was a garage in Menlo Park type company. Uh, they created this new market called search, internet search. Uh, and now they have about 90% of both the US and worldwide search activities use Google algorithms. Uh, they, they have this phenomenal browser called Chrome. It has about 70% of the market share in the US. And they also have this Android software, which powers 
the operating systems for uh, smartphones, and they it, they control eighty five percent of the market. Which I was shocked by that number because I thought Apple phones were a much bigger share of the market, but they're not. I mean, it's it's Samsung, it's Android phones. If you're looking worldwide, uh, the government claims in these that that. Government doesn't claim that Google is not an innovative, creative company, and I don't think anybody would deny that, right? But they claim that they achieve these these dominant market share numbers by engaging in predatory and illegal tactics, like paying uh, Apple and other computer companies and phone companies to make uh, Chrome their default browser, right? Or uh, by um, just providing the kind of inducements that didn't allow competitors to either write software for alternative systems or to compete directly with, with Google because they're just too dominant. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. Um, it's my prediction. Let me, be ask, long you, let me, let me yeah. ask a question on, the, on the, the way the law is applied in the situation. Is, uh, yeah. is it the case that, that you just need to show that by doing what they did, what they did, they got such dominance in the market, regardless of how they got here, they got to a very dominant position right now. And yeah. that alone by itself is, is, is a barrier to entry. By being so big, it created, yeah. they, they indirectly create a barrier to entry and it's harder for innovators to come in. And therefore we're <laughs> suffering from one, they have too much market power, so consumers are being hurt. Yeah. And two, no, no innovation can, can take place. Yeah. Or they have to show, the government has to show that there were acts along the way that were unlawful. Yeah, so again, not a lawyer. But I think there'll be a lot of rule of reason stuff here. They'll have to show that their their behavior and conduct has actually diminished competition in a way that hurts, hurts consumers. You know, it'll be interesting to see who comes forward. Uh, will Apple come forward and complain about this arrangement? I don't know. Will advertisers come forward and complain about this arrangement? They might. You know, Google controls a third. They get a third of all digital advertising dollars around the world. Uh, they they get it through running these online auctions that allocate their digital advertising space uh, in a way to maximize revenues, like they always would. Will will advertisers say this this process is bad for them? I don't know. Some will. Some won't. Uh, Google search algorithms also direct uh, people to other of their products, like their travel services products or their products used to evaluate local businesses. And those tend to compete with Yelp and other things, which those people will certainly complain, right? Um, so uh, it, it'll, it'll be a process of people showing up and some will say, I'm not harmed, I like it. Some will say, I'm harmed and I like it. And it'll be for a judge and maybe a jury to figure out what takes place. I think the general rule with this stuff though is that once you get above 50, these, these are just rule, this is a rule of thumb stuff. Once you get above 50%, 60%, um, you know, things that you do to solidify your competitive advantage or to expand it are gonna be looked on very negatively and critically by antitrust authorities. Uh, you know, it's kind of one of these deals where if you're not a dominant firm, you can do all the kind of things a dominant firm does and be okay. So if you're a dominant firm, it's a different set of rules. And, and I think the rules aren't uh, bright light rules. They are written down. It's not, it's not black letter law. It's more subjective analysis. There'll be a lot of economic consultants get rich out of this case. Uh, a lot of lawyers get rich out of this case. And, uh, and, I, and at the end of the day, I don't think we'll generate much new law. And, you know, small firms will still be able to use exclusive contracts to promote their products because they're small. The large firms will not. Um, it's just, I think I think the more general point too is, um, I, I think if you're, I used to tell people when I would teach a course like this in business school, I used to tell all the students, I said, look, when you guys get far along in your business career, you're either going to be one of two things. You're going to be a defendant and you're a defendant because you've done really well and advanced your products and, and uh, you know, everybody loves what you do, but someone you've out-competed or some up for some reason is going to sue you and say you did it illegally. And that's, that's okay. And the rest of you are going to be called plaintiffs and you'll be someone who says that you were harmed by the competitive activities of other firms. Now that's a little tongue in cheek and it's a little too cut and dry, but I think that, you know, antitrust law is, is, is bound to enter the life of any successful business person or unsuccessful business person. Uh, and it's just another reason why I think our students need to be equipped to and understand, you know, what are the general guidelines or parameters or bumpers that are, I'm going to run into when I try to be very successful in commerce. 
So let's loop back to the conversation on, on stakeholder capitalism. Yeah. Um, I'm Google, I'm growing, I'm very good, I'm very successful, yeah. I'm innovative. Uh, I'm getting a lot of market power as a result of the yeah. quality of my products. So do I have a responsibility at that point to say, listen, the next step here is giving me more market power. Should I move yeah. away from it? Is the stakeholder yeah. sort of a uh, flag ethos tells me that I shouldn't pursue market power because you know, the long run is that I'm gonna get sued by the government. Um, yeah. Is it a place where a company should by itself stop growing, stop trying yeah. to gather more market share? Because uh, see what I'm saying? There's a, there's a, yeah. there's a connection yeah. there with the, with the yeah, my so, hurting. So, yeah, so what you might wanna ask, and this is I think where companies like Google, Google is just really, they're, they're really good. They're really good. They're, they're like the LeBron James of, of their space, right? And I think a company like that gets in the following trouble. Like to answer your question directly, one thing a company might do is say, are my actions in the best interest of our customers and our potential customers? And in some cases, the answer would be no, because we're too dominant and we don't give some customers the choice of the variation that they need in order to advance your interests, right? A company like Google would never come up to that conclusion though, because they would say, we can supply what those people need because they're looking at the second best browser. They're looking at the second best search engine and they say, that's not any good. And they're getting a lot of feedback that that's true because the customers aren't using those kinds of things. Uh, now, should they, should they look at their algorithms and say, maybe our algorithms shouldn't direct everybody to our travel site who ask a travel question, right? Or, and I'm sure they don't, I'm sure they don't. But um, I, I think your question is, is interesting and it kind of shows the hazards of trying to self-restrain yourself in this context. Uh, and, what, you know, and, and maybe, maybe your point of your question was that stakeholder capitalism is going to be harder to implement on a volitional basis. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm not sure that I saw any investors really nervous that Google was dominant, you know. Yeah, uh, or, or whether there were any investment funds that said, you know, we really need to invest away from dominant tech firms because it's not in the best interest of society. It's just not the way that the, the, mar the capital market for tech firms tends to work. So I don't know, but it's, I do know that Google looks a lot like Standard Oil, looks a lot like Alcoa Aluminum, looks a lot like Microsoft. They're dominant companies that emerge, provide a lot of value and utility, create a lot of wealth, and then they just get to a point to where they're subject to the interests of the government and the government typically breaks up or in some way makes it easier for competitors to come into the market. I thought it was interesting a point that you made that, that by the time the, the standard oil case got to Supreme Court, their market share had gone down to 65%. And that yeah. was because the Texas oil boom, right? We found oil in Texas, yeah. a bunch of companies, the Wildcats came in and started cutting, basically cutting into yeah. their, their, their market, market dominance. And, and yeah, and, and Standard Oil didn't go down there, uh, which is another, it's, it's, I mean, this is the, um, what's the, um, uh, the tragedy of the innovator or something like the innovator's curse, mm -hmm. right? We're always too quick to move off our last great idea. Right. So, you know, there's a there, if you really think about that, that as being relevant and you read how to deal with Google. Well, maybe the idea with how to deal with Google is just wait a little bit because <laughs> they'll ultimately right. make the mistake of being too enamored with their last idea and someone else with the new idea is going to come along. I'm not suggesting that is the perfect substitute for antitrust. You know, I tend not to like dominant firms. And I think that uh, the behavior of Google and the social media space is reprehensible. But um, it is what it is. And Microsoft's another example of that. I think there was a lot of focus on Microsoft in the early 2000s, and then Apple came along and bypassed them, right, in a lot of ways. That's right. It's, yeah, that's right. That's uh, right. Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. This yeah. was a lot of fun. I, I, I want to commend you on what you're doing in these policy discussion talks. It's great. I hope the students uh, enjoy them and get a lot of information from them. And congratulations, too, on the Salem Center and all the work you're doing to lead that to great places. Well, thank you.